Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen. As you learned from the film, I'm going to have I'm going to talk about greenhouse gases, which were produced by the person with the mask on. But I'm not going to talk about an icy world. The world I'm talking about is a world of dinosaurs where there's no ice caps. It's a very equable climate, so dinosaurs roamed from the equator to far above the polar circle, and then suddenly they died. It took me 44 years of study to sort of find out what happened to them. So I'm going to give you an overview of 44 years of research, of which the last four years were very exciting. Because a few years ago, a nice guy, Mr. Robert De Palma, told me about a, a place in North Dakota where he found a tsunami deposit. Well, that's far away from the impact site in Mexico. I said, well, pfft. I get so many crank messages that I sometimes don't believe in them. But then he sent me a few pictures, like this one. And, and, and a series of meter-long fishes, a paddlefish, a sturgeon, and, uh, and then he sent me something else. And unfortunately, his mails first went into my spam box, so it took a while to pick them out and, and get into contact. But finally, we made it, and this spring we published together a nice paper. <laughs> As you can see, he's, an, he's a hopeless romantic. And whenever you were in his car and he turns on his radio, he turns this uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that's the reason why the place is called Tennis. So apparently that's a famous place within the, within the movie. But let's go back. This is what I do. I look at layers of rocks, and they're dated, and they're called after certain periods, like the Renaissance and the Middle Ages. And I'm going to talk about the Cretaceous, when the dinosaurs still lived, and the Paleocene, the period thereafter, and anything what happened in between. Well, the film here before, he said 65 million years, this is already 65.5, and now it's at 66, almost. So that evolves a little bit. I'm going to tell you what happens here. This is what I do. I study layers of rocks, laid down, mostly in the sea, layer after layer, like pages in the history book, so you can turn them back and learn something about the history of the Earth. And that's how I got involved with the mass extinction of dinosaurs and many other stuff. So what went extinct? If we look in the sea, you see whole reefs here in Oman, uh, squids, uh, another type of squids, giant sea turtles, which were on the diet of these uh, mosasaurs in the sea, and on land, of course. And I'm afraid this is about the only dinosaur I'm going to show you, because for me they're very unimportant, because here and there you find one. And I want statistics. I want to deal with numbers, how they get, how they disappear, how quickly they do, and they're fairly worthless. So a few years ago, I was with Anna Schulp here, where they dug up the Tyrannosaurus naturalis. Here you can see his tooth in the neck of his, uh, his skull, and nowadays it's sitting here in its right place. So they got extinct, but how? And when they disappeared, just thereafter, this is to show you the whole history of the, of the mammals. Uh, they start with marsupials, now in Australia, and the modern mammals, which are very rare during the reign of the dinosaurs. The soon they got extinct, you see there is an explosion of life and new species, which led to all the species we know today. And among them are the first primates, which are our ancestors. So they get a chance, after they died and dominated uh, the ecosystems, they took and got our chance to evolve. So that's the importance of my message, you have first have to remove and kill an existing stable ecosystem before something else gets a chance. Uh, don't draw too many conclusions about it for today, <laughs> though. But. <laughs> but I'm more interested in these tiny critters. They live in the sea as plankton, and especially these ones. These are about 60 species, extremely diversified, adapted to the surface of the sea. Some are carnivores, some are omnivores, some are symbionts, whatever. They have their own lifestyles, and also they, I call them dinosaurs of the sea, go extinct. But more importantly, these are tiny algae. And they are produced in masses, and they constitute most of the sediments on the seafloor. Like you can see here, the cliffs of Dover, it's just a little period during the reign of the dinosaurs, consists of 99% of these tiny algae. 
and they're the base of the food chain. So if, if they disappear, everything dependent on them in a sequence gets extinct, and that's exactly what happens. So this is my field area when I started 44 years ago in southern Spain, and I was trying to make sense of the southern part of Spain in order to see how this southern part fit to the rest of Spain, and it didn't fit and didn't understand it at all. So I switched my subject, and I found <laughs> the extinction of something much more important and much more exciting. So here you see the ancient, this was deep, in the, deep down in the sea, and this is the remains of all the layers you see here, layer by layer by layer. And of course, these are tilted, as we say, it, by the forces of mountain building, so I first have to turn them back. And what I saw was the Cretaceous with the old species and the next period separated by a mass extinction and a very thin clay layer which separates them both. This is what I did in Spain and my good friend and competitor Walter Alvarez did the same stuff in Italy. So this is where he is. This is at an even deeper sea, 2,000 meter water depth, also tilted so you have to look closely. You see the, the end of the reign of the dinosaurs the beginning of new life, and then something in between, a very thin clay layer. And wherever I go, and I've been to many places, New Zealand, in, the, in most of the drillings in the deep sea, South America, you can always put a knife in the boundary. Well, that means something very sudden happened right there. Nothing else can explain it. And if I enlarge it a little bit more, you can see the critters I was studying. They're sort of divided in, they reach all the way up to this tiny clay layer and then in the next layer they disappear, they're gone and replaced by new species, fortunately. But what's the clay layer? So Walter Alvarez took a different approach and I want to know how long it takes to deposit this clay layer. I did the same but in a different place in Spain where the layer was a lot thicker and if you look over the world, you can see the clay layer here in Denmark, in Tunisia, in Turkey, in, in, in New Zealand, in several places. So apparently something stopped in the ocean, producing the base of the food chain as layers on the seafloor. And if those calcareous animals and algae are not there anymore, you see the clay drifting in from the rivers and blown in by the sea takes over. And this is just the residual stuff which also arrives at the seafloor in the slow rate. And the thickness of this layer, and I have made several calculations, means it took 10,000 years before new life started again above this clay layer. That's quite a while. Can be significant, and maybe that's important for what we're doing to our planet right now. So anything we're doing has some significance. At the base of the layer, this is the clay layer, you see an even thinner layer of two millimeters, and that layer is enriched in the element iridium. And iridium plays a major role in the whole story, because it's rare in the crust of the Earth, not deep in the Earth, in the crust of the Earth, and it's abundant in meteorites. That's, this is a picture here. All the iridium in the Earth is stored in the nickel-iron core. It's not in the mantle, it's not in the crust, and even less so in the crust, while in the meteorite, it's divided over the whole meteorite. So you see, the abundance is about three orders of magnitude more abundant in in, uh, in a big meteorite, and when it crashes on land and vaporizes and throws its uh, content over the whole world, you see a little bit of iridium means mostly there is something extraterrestrial happening. And at the base, you see this is from Spain, and, and the extinction is quite immediately above the layer, everything is extinct. It's the same in New Zealand, it's the same in Turkey, it's the same in Denmark, and the same in Georgia, south of the Caucasus. A thin layer over the entire globe. And of course, you're, most of you are young and, uh, and have, a, uh, how do you call it, a Jacques Japan or something to calculate. How much is that? How much is the layer of two millimeters? Uh, quickly, 4 p r squared, and what, what is the radius of the Earth, etc. Well, I won't dwell on that, so the formula is 4 p r squared. <laughs> the Earth's surface is four times pi times 600, 371 kilometers squared. So you calculate it, it's about 500 million cubic kilometers times the thickness in kilometers of the layer, etc. It's a thousand cubic kilometers. Well, that's a useless number, of course, because how you can imagine that? But that came from one single place and it thrown over the entire world by a very violent event. So it fills a thousand kilometers, uh, a square, a cube by 10 by 10 by 10 kilometers, in which the Mount Everest fits 
from the seafloor up till the top about three times. So you can imagine the energy which it takes to throw the Everest three times over the entire world. So there is something violent going on. And this is, uh, this is a model how it works. It makes a deep hole, throws an ejecta curtain, and causes a tsunami in a certain way. If we run it again, you can see how it works. This is a layer of two kilometers in a model. And here you see a thin layer of water, and when the ejecta curtain rolls, it pushes forward a thick tsunami. And that's exactly what happened in Mexico around the Gulf of Mexico. So in quick sequence, it happens to come here, 18 centimeters a second, 10 kilometers in size, and creates a big hole first. Explodes and throws a lot of material back into the atmosphere. And even beyond that, the atmosphere doesn't play a role at all. It reaches high speeds, even escape velocity, so something of this material uh, can be found on the moon. I made an appointment, but I'm too long and too tall and too heavy, so I won't, I won't make it in the next space. SpaceX, whoever does it. But it throws a lot of melted material, because the energy is transferred to, to an explosion, and then part of it is melted and thrown out of the crater. We call that tectites, molten, glassy stuff. And then finally, the crater starts to bounce back, and even bounces back till uh, several kilometers. That's, of course, too high, it's overshot. And then it bounces back again, and it forms what we call a peak ring in the final crater shape. But this sort of models leads to predictions, yeah, because just the iridium is probably not enough to sustain the whole theory. So let's look what, what's thrown out of, uh, of, the, of the crater itself. So part of it is probably on the moon. Part of it, of this cloud, is recondensed in the form of tiny spherules. Yeah, you see the layer, of two millimeters, is almost saturated with these tiny condensates, sort of raindrops. Part of it is thrown out as glass with a bubble in the middle, and there is a whole host of other material which is thrown out of the crater. So the strength of the theory, and I put my uh, 44 of uh, research life into it, uh, you can sort of predict. Uh, iridium is not alone to sustain a theory. You have to make follow-ups, predictions, and if the predictions come true, your theory grows stronger and stronger. So here are a number of predictions which we formulate. Uh, it should be over the whole world. It should be uh, the ratio between the elements in the middle of the, of the periodic table should be about extraterrestrial and not terrestrial. On land is in the ocean, synchronous, always at the same time. Additional impact products, isotope ratios, uh, precisely coinciding with the instinct, and finally the location of the impact crater. And as you can see, most of these predictions came true, and I'll show you some of them but only one didn't, and that is why we should find iridium at other mass extinctions, I'll show you in one of the first pictures. And so far we weren't lucky, although one of my students in Brussels is probably finding another one where there's a little bit of iridium, so hopefully. So here is a, a whole array of these uh, uh, things which are thrown out of the crater, and especially these, as you can see, they're big and they're there, but they fall back. Hey, if you see a layer of two millimeters full of them, you can imagine that they fall back by the billions and billions and start glowing up there in the sky, and that may have consequences. Also, during our uh, research, we found out that uh, the two millimeter thick layer occurs over the whole world, but the layer increases from two millimeters to two centimeters in North America to several uh, centimeters with these glassy stuff in the island of Haiti, which is much closer to the crater. Uh, this is in North America. You see those tectites, those melted stuff at the bottom, and then the top part is the iridium. Because the iridium is in the vapor cloud, and is thrown out of very fine particles, but it eventually settles back on the atmosphere, and those big tectites, they come and go and are very quickly. So they're separated in time, the fine grain stuff on the top, and the coarser grain stuff below it. Even thicker, here you see that the bubble resides in the middle of the tectites. Why is that? And uh, André Kuipers has nicely shown it while in the space station, because he threw a bubble of water and injected it with air. And you can see that the bubble remains while floating in the, in the weightlessness of the space station. It remains in the middle. And that's exactly what happened here. These ones, melted, are thrown out of the atmosphere while, melt, uh, while melted, 
solidified and fell back. And that means that this bubble is a perfect vacuum because it was created in space. And I made several uh, little tests to prove that, and indeed the bubble is completely vacuum. So all this, the increase of the thickness, the increase of several other products, especially the tectites, I have here a few from another impact, and it is bone-dry glass, and they spin in flight and land eventually thousands of kilometers away, led to the finding of the crater. I've been many times here in the northern part of Yucatan in Mexico, and uh, you can see it while driving, you just see that little bit of rough terrain, it's a very boring landscape because they chopped the whole forest down and it's a secondary growth, you see absolutely nothing. But on satellite images, you can see the shape of the crater a little bit here in the relief, in the, in the, in the forests, and here even in land use. But it was eventually discovered by deviations from the local gravity. Uh, here in the middle, you have probably a tenth of a gram, if you walk there, a tenth of a gram lighter than in the middle where you're a tenth of a gram heavier. But with sensitive equipment, you can measure that. That's dangerous stuff, I tell you. <laughs> okay, even on Google Earth, hey, you can see, you, that's a nice exercise. You can see pinholes and uh, little water holes which follow the, the rim of the crater. Eventually, I participated in both of them. We did two drillings in the crater, one in the south and one in 2016 just offshore, on what we call the peak ring in the middle of the crater. I won't dwell on this one, there's much to tell about, but that's not what I'm going to dwell on. It's the, it's the other one, here in the south, because there we hit first the filling of the crater, then the melted material which fell back into the crater, somehow was thrown up or was washed back, because the crater is underwater almost immediately, and then it hit a very special, what we call a target, the target rock, where the meteorite landed. Almost everything is vaporized, and it consists of 30% gypsum, sulfates, and 60% of limestone and dolomite. The one contains SOx, an aerosol of sulfur, very capable of reflecting sunlight, and the other one is CO2. Well, you all know about it. It's a, a well-known greenhouse effect. So when it vaporizes, look what happens. Present day, we have about two well, a quarter of a megaton sulfur now in the atmosphere, in gases. Mount Pinatubo, which is the largest eruption of a volcano in the last century, injected 20 megaton of sulfur, which led to a global cooling of half a degree for a full year. The largest prehistoric eruption we know, the Toba Lake in Sumatra, it's a huge one, produced about 1,000 megatons, but this one created 100,000 megatons. So what are the consequences? Probably decades of cooling. So now we know we have a rare meteorite landing on an even rarer surface which produces lots of gases. Is that the reason why the dinosaurs got extinct? Well, let's have a look at what we now know about the consequences. So the dinosaurs lived, as I told you, in a world which is very equal. So all the species in the sea and on land are evolved in certain niches where they're very specialized. And maybe because they're so specialized in an equable world, they're very uh, vulnerable to whatever mechanism is superimposed on them. So it's warm, very equable, and nobody has to fear except the things that's being eaten by these creatures. Then, suddenly, the shooting stars come back. Billions and billions. So they put us for maybe an hour under a global broiler. And people like Jay Melosh have calculated that the broiling effect of these the shooting stars coming back is enough to ignite leaves and dead wood and that sort of stuff. So it, there's a flash heating of the atmosphere. Okay, if you're a dinosaur, you're thick and your skin will be burnt, but you may survive it. But then comes the next thing. Here we get the veil of dust and aerosols of sulfur, which are very effective in bouncing back the sunlight which is coming in. And these aerosols stay there for well over a decade. So it becomes very cold for some decades. So you can imagine a dinosaur with already all his burning wounds now turning into a freezing atmosphere. It's at least 10 degrees centigrade that it cools off everywhere for a short time. 
And then when that settles, after it's rained out, the greenhouse gases remain for much longer. And if you calculate the enormous amount of greenhouse gases from the rotting corpus, corpses, from rotting organisms, from the CO2 vaporized, from the, 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 uh, the oil vaporized due to the impact, there's also oil in the subsurface. So then it becomes very warm. So if you're not extinct by the radiation or the cooling or the warming period for thousands of years, well, you have a mechanism where you can make them extinct. And that's exactly what you can fit in. But still, it's basically a matter of luck being able to, to, to dig holes to be shielded from all of this. Do we have evidence for it? Yes, we do. Because there is a place in Texas where there's a, a beautiful succession across the, uh, uh, the same boundary. And there, uh, Johan Velikoop, is also an ex-student of mine, measures the membranes of bacteria which in, with an increasing amount of, uh, of uh, pentan uh, molecules incorporated in the cell membranes. And that's a function of temperature in the sea. And fortunately, these membranes are still survive in these sediments. So he measured them, and this is what he got. So, we're coming to the tsunami, which rolled in the Gulf of Mexico. So we see the warm period based on the measurements of the uh, membranes. Then it becomes cold at the same time that the iridium is still slowly raining down on the seafloor. So it's a sudden spike, 10 years, maybe, we don't know. The time control is not that good. And then it becomes, for years and years, for, for thousands of years, it becomes warmer than before. So I think we have very good evidence. There's more evidence, I like migration patterns for dinoflagellates, but that takes too long to explain it. So that's what I think is the reason for the extinction of at least the dinosaurs and many other organisms. But the meteorite fell also halfway in the sea. And as you can see here on this picture, the tsunami goes very quick in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic, and then it slows down and works its way up the coast of North America. And everywhere where you have an outcrop there, uh, have we found the remains of a tsunami layer at the bottom of the seafloor in eastern Mexico. So this is just a few of them, but there are tens of outcrops where you see the remains of the tsunamis. And they have a very specific <coughs> build-up. I think I'm going to take a... <laughs> ah, that's much better. <laughs> it contains CO2, right? I'm, uh, Okay, so how does it look like? Here you see the sandstone layer separating the periods with dinosaurs and the way above it, and it has a very special structure. <coughs> this is the sandstone with indications for the currents of the tsunami running in and out of the country, with the tectites at the bottom, the tsunami in the middle, with uh, several times it switches back and forth, and then finally <coughs> the fine-grained iridium falls on top of it. So that perfectly fits into the picture you see the dark sediments here, light sediments there. The extinction is also very nicely attached to that. But maybe the tsunami went much further. Here is a romantic in his place uh, pointing to the bottom of a tsunami layer, which I was now convinced it was a tsunami. And uh, this is a very nice tale how we get the tsunami that far up north in North America. Originally, there was a shallow sea separating East and West America, especially in the Cretaceous, but it may be, most people think it has dried up at that time. So it's difficult. So this is what he showed me. I'll show you a few of the beautiful fossils he found. And curiously enough, he found an ammonoid, which is a sea creature, together with two big fishes, which are freshwater fishes. So how do you mix them together? Well, in an estuarium, like in, uh, in Zeeland, but also in a tsunami when you have salt water running in with all the animals in it, and when it retreats, you see the fishes taking with them. And in between, did he show me pieces of glass? And glass is something uh, just exactly like this one, black, uh, very dry, and uh, this is extremely good for dating with radioactive methods. So we have dated this stuff in the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam, and that's the reason why this whole group got together in his co-author on the first paper. And it turns out that this is exactly 65.79 million years ago. Almost 66. 
So these are all the names of it. You can remember Claudia Kuiper did the dating, Melanie did some of the fishes, Pim Kaskus did the tectites, and Johan Velikop did the uh, dinoflagellates there. And this is a movie by uh, Pim Kaskus. He went with a drone to show you the tennis uh, flying around. And, and it's, it's this thing, it's not big. Hey, here we're walking, Robert and me, across the surface of the tsunami. And here you see the trench where he did all his amazing discoveries. So everything here is still buried under there. So we expect tons of new finds, etc. So one of them, I had to go there. This is me sitting there pointing at one of the fishes. It has a lower jaw, upper jaw, and a very long snout. Battlefish has a long snout. And here in the gill regions, if you blow it up, you see that the gills of the fishes have caught these tiny tectites while they were in flight and falling into the water and the fish was swimming there. So now we know that these ones are the victims because they caught the actual impact products in their gills. Uh, here you see it in an, uh, a 3D image, X-ray image from Stanford. My student Melanie made an even better image in, in Grenoble where you can see if she makes the X-ray picture in a rock Here's the, the shield of the, of the gills, the gills themselves, and the tectites inside them. So they came down. You can also say, well, they were there and they kept them for, for several days, but that, that's not the case. I'll show you that in a minute. So these are, together, the first victims ever of the KT boundary impact. And you have to imagine it's a fish like this, which swims like a whale shark. <laughs> Normally, he catches tiny shrimps because that's his food, so he needs the rakers to catch him out of the water. And now he had bad luck, he caught some of the tectites. But I'm, I'm afraid he didn't die from the tectites. I mean, he must have been used to, to catching this. So maybe the salt water influx of the tsunami did him in rather than the tectites. But it's a nice coincidence, and we know now how they died. And Melanie made an image of one of the bones, I think the spine bones, where you can see the growth of the bone as a sort of tree rings, yeah, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer. And she found out that the beast here died somewhere in the early spring, let's say or the late spring, June, May, something. Very interesting, still has to be published. And of course, in the tsunami, this tsunami number one, tsunami number two, and then finally a thin layer with iridium on top. Everything we found everywhere in the world is incorporated in the in the deposit. So we're extremely sure that this is created by the impact in Mexico and came here in the northern part. So this is what it is. This is our field vehicle. And here you see a cross-section of a river. And a cross-section of a river makes a meandering band. And a river usually builds out in one side in this direction and it cuts out the, the, the banks on this side. That's exactly what happens here. Okay, here you see the cross-section of this one uh, this is the uh, when you cut through a river. This is the outbuilding, what we call a point bar. And then on top of it is the tsunami deposit. Uh, on the next picture, you see how it's draped in a very deep channel. Probably came, uh, this is the highest tsunami level, came in from AC, which we didn't know existed, and brought all the goodies there. And of course, in the side, uh, in the overbank deposits next to the river, do we see the layer with iridium and everything else. So here you see, we were there, Walter Alvarez, this is Jesse, sits here in the audience, this is the wife of Walter and everybody, this is my student Melody. We're looking at something there in the pit, which we analyzed in the campsite in Bowman underneath a microscope with an attached video camera, so the excitement on the screen. Look at that, oh, wow. look at that. Oh, wow. oh that's wow. the money shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And I have some Where's Jackson? Is he taking pictures of this? Yeah. 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 There are ten people taking pictures. Oh, Always. Yeah. <laughs> it's two thirds encapsulated in the amber. This it's two thirds. So it's two thirds still in the thing. The bubble is in the middle. That, that, same. Oh, oh, this is gold. Yeah. This is Look gold. Look at that. Yeah, this is oh. the stuff. So the tree was What alive. is it? Tell me. This is the unaltered glass <laughs> from the Chicxulub impact, blown out of the crater as glass, you, yeah. caught in amber and not altered it at all. <laughs> well, this is what the excitement is of being a scientist, when you're on the spot <laughs> and you find something highly unusual. And they were found on the tree, they see several tree trunks, which are also 
taken away by the, by the tsunami and deposited there. And this is one of the tree trunks with a, what you call a knus there. And it's scorched. It's full of uh, charcoal. It probably was irradiated by all the incoming tectites. And there are runnels of, of uh, amber on there. And you see inside the amber, do we see the same tectites? So they were analyzed, etc. And here's the one from the microscope embedded in the, in the, and also shielded by the amber. So it's not weathered, which it usually is. And this is to be analyzed by Pim Kaskas. He sits here in the audience, so you can ask him questions later on, whatever it means. But it's, it's really good for years of research, I think. So what else? He found termites or ants inside their holes covered by the tsunami layer, the mud, so they couldn't escape. The same for wasps inside burrows, also underneath, and they were, they were trapped in there. And like these burrow holes of mammals, hey, you see the entrance of a cave, a uh, brood chamber, another one. And in some of them were even the remains of these mammals. So these were caught and, and covered by the tsunami as well. And then something else surprising, eggs of a flying dinosaur, pterosaur, with the embryo still inside. Here you see the wings folded up, left, right wing, the beak, the rib cage, the feet, and all of them. So still, it's unpublished, so you may not photograph it, but it's very exciting to see. It. And not even, even less important, here you see the tsunamite over the point bar, and apparently on the surface of the point bar, these dinosaurs were walking. So we see footprints of a, of a plant eater, and the footprints of a meat eater chasing each other, maybe. And this sort of ended the long standing controversy that there are a lot of people saying, oh, the dinosaurs were already on their way out when the meteorite fell. So it's a sort of the straw that broke the camel's neck while they were basically extinct by a different mechanism. Well, they're not. They were alive and running and kicking as soon as the tsunami came in. A bone covered by a skin of a triceratops. Even naturalis does it have plenty of feathers, probably plucked from, uh, from another dinosaur, Velociraptor. And then a few things which, which are still uncertain, a few riddles remain. Here you see the first tsunami, nicely layered with sand and clay, then more sandy, and here you see pits. And in the pits, at the bottom of the pits, you see a large tectite, 200 times heavier than anything around it. And that one, also belongs to the impact in, in Mexico. And it came down in the second tsunami. How long did it take? Now we don't know yet. Here you see it. It's a, it's a large one with all the bubbles inside them sitting in, in the bottom of these pits. Another problem. A tsunami going 2,000 kilometers from the Gulf to the north, how do you get it there? And on time, eh? the, yeah, the tsunami has to be there when the tectites come, come in. It's about, the average speed of a tsunami is about 40 kilometers an hour. So it takes 55 hours, two to three days to get there. Well, the meteorite from the crater comes there in 15 to 60 minutes. There's a mismatch there. We can't explain it. How do we get the tsunami all the way up? Well, these are there and the fishes are swimming. So it, it just takes too long. Two to three days is no way, unless you sail the tectites around the moon and get them back or something like that, but uh, it seems rather improbable. <laughs> uh, about as improbable as uh, some of the tweets of Thierry Baudet, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> so it is not possible, but we have, a, we have a solution. And therefore, I have to go back to the subcontinent of India, which, coincident or not, is covered by a huge pile of lava flows and volcanics. Hey, you see it, almost covered at the same time before, during and after the meteorite impact. And there is a controversy raging, is the impact the cause of the extinction or has the Deccan vul vulcanism something to do with it? And together with the group from Berkeley, we tried to solve this by saying, well, maybe part of the vulcanism is triggered by the enormous earthquake set in motion by the Chicxulub impact. Uh, this is what happens if you look at the world at that time. Here is the volcano of uh, Reunion, and India is running northwards. Uh, this is how the, how the plates on the Earth are walking. And so somewhere here, if you look closely, you see the Deccan traps extruding here, and then it runs north. 
So somehow, India is still <laughs> in the southern hemisphere, does it have any relationship with the impact here in Mexico? Uh, we know, don't know for sure, but there's a good case to be made. So here again, this is Reunion. This is the hot spot, as we say it. It's a very deep volcano coming from the core of the Earth. It's very stable, so the plates are moving over the stable plume, as we say it. So India is moving over a plume, a plume while it's erupting. So at that time, what is now Reunion, India is sitting there. And later it shifts to the north, even further north, and finally where it's today. But the volcanism comes from the Reunion volcano here. The, the chemistry, etc., is almost the same. And the impact itself. Here is a model by someone who said, well, an impact here in Mexico causes huge earthquake waves, which are really a little bit re reinforced on the other side of the world. So in the so in, in the region of 3,000 kilometers, we see that the movement of the Earth is still three to one and a half meters. Can you imagine that you're sitting there 3,000 kilometers away and you move be it slowly a little bit away? And even as far as the Deccan Traps, 16,000 kilometers is still almost half a meter. So isn't it possible that the earthquake waves caused by the impact have opened up the Earth while, and that lead the way to more volcanism. If you look on Google Earth, you see indeed that the upper lavas, uh, this is from right from above, are not cracked, while the lavas below it are full of tiny folds. And here's a large one which stops and goes further and stops, etc. So these folds here are older <coughs> than the next phase of the lavas. And this is still raging on in the literature. People are dating the lavas and trying to pinpoint when they came and when they do not came. But the story is, maybe it can help us out. Uh, this is a plume coming from the mantle. It stops at the base of the lithosphere, 250 kilometers deep, forms a puddle of melt, and occasionally it goes to the next level, to the base of the crust, still very hot. And here, whenever a crack opens up and the Indian plate is moving in this direction, you see volcanoes spreading out the enormous amount of lava. <coughs> and India is running its way over there. But if these cracks are opened by the earthquake movements caused by the impact, maybe it reinforces and accelerates the extrusions of lavas. I mean, this lecture is too short to explain all of that. If you want another lecture, I can do it. <laughs> but can it help us? Is there a connection between our impossibility of getting the tsunami there and the earthquake waves? And the guy who invented the idea uh, Mark Richards showed me this movie while we were driving over the landscape in India. Not only here, in the next tour, this is from here. It's very quiet no reason for such a wave. Yeah, there is not a, 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 an ocean steamer or cruiser running around in the fjord, there are many of them, which in their wakes produced, there was nothing, not a ship, nothing. And here's another one. Oh, they, way not. they ran outside <laughs> because they missed the first wave. So they ran outside and took the second wave. So what happened here? Look at the date. If anybody remembers what happened on March 3, 2011. Just a half hour earlier, half an hour earlier, Fukushima or the Tohoku earthquakes are shit. But the tsunamis take hours and hours and hours to get there, so it cannot be within half an hour, it cannot be the tsunami. So to cross 8,000 kilometers to Norway, you have to deal with the speed of earthquake waves. And they are fast. And the fastest go by 8 kilometers a second is almost as fast as the 11 kilometers a second which it takes to escape the Earth. Much faster than in the air or in water. And that's just the sound waves in the Earth, but the transverse waves, which go this way or go up and down, they go somewhat slower, but still really fast. And the guy Bondevik, I know him quite well, he's a specialist in tsunamis, calculated that it is the transverse waves which arrive within that half an hour, 
and he, he, he looked at surveillance cameras where the mast of all the sailing ships were going back and forth because that made the timing right. And he concluded eh, that the fjords have steep walls on either side that if you bring the walls in motion very slowly, you can transfer the energy to the body of water and you create a tsunami. Is that the solution for our problem in Mexico and here? The P waves are the sound waves, they travel fastest. They're there very quickly. So between 15 and 30 minutes we get earthquakes with probably up and down motion in this body of water which may set in motion the tsunami. In, in the Tanis River, which ends here in the estuary, and then we can have the tectites in time to be caught either in the upper layers being very big or in the gills of the fishes. And you have to remember the earthquake is 20,000 times heavier than the Tohoku earthquake in Japan. That's not, not it's really huge. So the whole world must have sounded like a ring, like a bell or something like that. So this is what I want you to leave and have an impression on. Unique death assemblage, weird travel times, dinosaurs alive at the time of impact. You have a tentative coupling of seismic waves and tsunamis. And Saichi is another term, that's a standing wave, but it behaves the same as a tsunami. Inland sea existed, etc., etc., for in the near future. And I thank you very much. <laughs>